Hello, I'm Tim Finley. I'm an Associate Director of Bureau Hubble's Bath Office here in the UK, working predominantly on Stadia projects. I also head up our service and spatial structures expert community, so I spend a lot of my time thinking about cables, what Stadia roofs, and other long span tensile systems. As we are all becoming increasingly aware of the impact that we are having on our planet, climate, and environment, we rightly want to try to make a difference through the areas where we have an influence. For structural engineers, that means designing structures that use less material, less steel, less concrete. But for long span structures, particularly tensile structures, that's exactly already what we try to do. So this paper is an opportunity to look back at what's really good about some of the minimum material structures that we have designed over the past 25 years and see what can be celebrated and where we can learn for the future. But before I present some information in earnest, I need to own up. This may look like an academic paper, but this is not an academic paper. Many, probably all, of the numbers I present are approximations. So I hope you are able to take this for what it is and attempt to let some historic design data speak into today's conversation about limiting embodied carbon. One of the ways that we in Bureau Hubble are looking to influence all the buildings we design towards lower embodied carbon is through our embodied carbon assessment tool. The relatively simple premise is that if we know how much of each material is being used, then we can calculate how much embodied carbon is being created. Using robust material data allows quick material estimates to produce meaningful measurements of embodied carbon throughout the design process. The database of knowledge that we developed allows us to track our progress against our target of moving towards designing zero carbon buildings. I won't go into the detail here, but all the numbers that I present today come out of this embodied carbon assessment tool. I also need to take a moment to thank my friends at Serge Ferrari and Saint Gabin for providing embodied carbon data on the tensile membrane materials. So the relatively simple task today is to look at the embodied carbon within these three long span cable net structures and see what can be learned. You'll hopefully recognise the Millennium Dome and the London 2012 Olympic Stadium, but you may not recognise the Budapest Athletic Stadium currently under construction. In order to give ourselves a benchmark for comparison, I'll briefly show you the kind of data to expect based on a reasonable design data for a generic stadium. My sample is roughly based on the Education City Stadium in Qatar, but it's really just meant to be seen as a large but efficient stadium roof with traditional rigid cladding. Key points to note are that we're seeing a total embodied carbon of approximately 400 kilograms meter squared, and that can become a reasonable benchmark for looking at other roofs. Don't be confused by the fact that the whole life number is lower than the construction value. That begins to make an allowance for the possibility of recycling some of the material used at the end of life. It's also worth noting that the majority of the embodied carbon comes from the superstructure steelwork, with a relatively small 11% coming from the cladding material. And so, on to the Millennium Dome. It was designed before I started my professional career at Bureau Happold, so I didn't have the pleasure of working on it, but I have had reason to troll through the old drawings at various times, and can assure you that it's an absolute pleasure. As you probably know, the dome is not a dome. It's a cable net, stressed between the 12 masts and the ground, and clad in a tensile membrane surface. It's a wonderful lightweight structure. There can't be many other structures of this scale that can boast 32 kilograms per meter square of structural weight. So I was confident that we would be seeing some really exceptional low embodied carbon figures, but we don't. The 300 kilograms per meter squared isn't that great. The why becomes clear when we look at the breakdown. The steel and cladding figures are completely swapped from the benchmark stadium. This time steel sits at 12%, but the PTFE glass fibre membrane causes a whopping 72% of the embodied carbon. The reality is that the production of ETFE glass fibre membrane generates a lot of carbon. It's a great material for many, many reasons, longevity, light transmittance, etc. And the fact that the surface weighs almost nothing is the reason behind the ultra low steel weight. But from an embodied carbon perspective, it's not good. I couldn't leave it there. Taking another look at the figures based on replacing the PTFE glass fibre, with PVC coated polyester brings some much more exciting low carbon numbers. The environmental conversation around PVC coating has many other facets to it, and we would almost certainly be reskinning the dome around now. But the point that we can make here is that an ultra low embodied carbon value really is possible. And next, we move on to a structure where PVC polyester was used as a tensile membrane cladding material. Designed for the 2012 Olympics, with embodied carbon becoming a real design driver and cost being at the forefront of every UK taxpayer's mind, the 2012 stadium roof was an opportunity to drive material and embodied carbon as low as possible. Coming in at just over 200 kilograms per meter squared embodied carbon, 
this is a real improvement on the generic stadium roof and I think can be seen as a good target benchmark for future work we do. The Millennium Dome was a one-off structure, but this is what is realistically possible again and again. And finally, on to a current project. And as you can see, this is an honest appraisal of where we are rather than trying to make the numbers look good. I'm genuinely proud of what we're doing in Budapest, but as you can see, for a tensile roof system, the numbers aren't great. Much of that is to do with architecture and geometry. This roof will look fabulously slender as it sits in the banks of the Danube, and we'll have achieved much of what the client and architect are targeting. But the result is an embodied carbon value higher than I would have liked. But it's not all about too much steel. Again, the ETFE glass fibre membrane is the most significant contributor to the overall embodied carbon value. And so, as I come to the end, we'll take one final look at how a PVC polyester version of Budapest would have measured up. Interestingly, it drops in just below the benchmark generic stadium. There's much that can be said about why, but I'll leave it simply with the fact that simply choosing a tensile lightweight cladding system does not guarantee very low tonnage and very low embodied carbon. Geometry matters. On Budapest, I'm proud of what we've created within this constraints, but I'll definitely be pushing harder for a low embodied carbon value next time out. My time's up, so I'll leave you with a few key thoughts. First, embodied carbon accounting is possible and needs to be part of every design we put forward, benchmarked against good practice. Second, exceptionally low embodied carbon values are also possible using tensile systems. Third, efficient structural geometry is key if we want to hit the very lowest embodied carbon values. And finally, we need to understand the impact that the choice of material has, particularly our tensile membranes. We need to be using low embodied carbon membranes, and I'm hopeful that this paper will encourage manufacturers to continue to look at ways to reduce embodied carbon. My time's up, but many, many thanks for listening.